Every physical event has a physical cause. There are no supernatural events. And, um, and yet, you never, he is the, the father of science, but, uh, but you never hear what happened to superstition. Well, superstition went right on. And it's still going right on. Uh, and as I said earlier, by every poll, about 90% of the population regards itself as, uh, uh, as believing uh, in a god or a divine creature. Um, for the next few hundred years, the Greek civilization made enormous strides in basic science. And the greatest of them all was Archimedes, but Archimedes was, uh, uh, was killed, in fact, by a Roman soldier uh, when, the, uh, when the Romans did away with the, uh, uh, with the Greek world. And um, according to the story, the, uh, uh, the soldier was sent by the, uh, uh, by the leader of the Roman forces. Um, he was anxious to meet. With, uh, with this great man who was well known even in Rome and, uh, uh, and he sent him to, uh, to bring this man to meet him and, uh, and when he came upon Mark Archimedes, Archimedes was in the midst of a calculation and he said, yes, yes, of course, as soon as I finish this calculation. Well, the, uh, the soldier was so outraged that he would not be more respectful of a, uh, of a Roman general that he pulled out his sword and killed him on the spot. And, uh, uh, and we lost a great deal at that point. Well, so what did we do for the next 2,000 years? Well, at about that time, there was a, uh, uh, an event in the Middle East. And for 2,000 years, we went searching for the Holy Grail. And we're still searching, in case you haven't read Dan Brown. He's got a new book out. And uh, uh, I mean, it's going on right here. Uh, and I, I just learned yesterday that Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart um, was a, uh, uh, well, what is there, the organization of people that protect the, uh, the Templars, yes. and. Uh, uh, my goodness, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. I mean, this is widespread. Uh, my father was a Mason, and uh, I did an interview one day in a Masonic temple here in Washington. Uh, uh, I don't know why they chose that spot, but at any rate, uh, I, I mean this metaphorically. But essentially, we stopped learning for uh, for two thousand years. But in the meantime, of course, we built up this. This is just a, a, a painting, a beautiful painting. This has been an important part of our, our history somehow. Um, it began to change very slowly at first. This is the church, the cathedral in Pisa, that was attended by Galileo's family. They had a pew that the family sat at in the church. And allegedly, this picture is taken from the pew that Galileo would sit in every Sunday. And, um, and many of you can probably remember, as I do, uh, going to church on Sunday and trying to think, well, you know, what am I going to think about during this time? Uh, so you, uh, you do your daydreaming, and Galileo, was attracted by that chandelier, which hangs down from the beautiful dome of the cathedral. And, uh, and as the great doors of the cathedral are opened and closed, the, uh, the air motion causes the chandelier to swing ever so slightly. 
And, uh, and so he sat there trying to figure out what he could learn from that. And he used his pulse as a clock. Uh, there, there weren't much in the way of clocks in those days, so the pulse was pretty good. So he used his pulse to time the swing. And what he learned was that the time was always the same, whether it swang in a big arc or a very, very small one. And of course, that's one of the first things that our students learn in physics is why that's so. And um, so now Galileo was not a great mathematician. Uh, he was a great observer. And, um, and of course, later got in trouble with, uh, the, with the Catholic Church over the issue of, uh, uh, of whether the earth moves, that we were the center of the universe and everything must rotate around us. And uh, that was the dogma of the church and it could not be wrong. And, uh, uh, and that there are many apocryphal stories. He was, uh, uh, he was threatened and eventually had to recant. And, uh, uh, and we've, we have all heard that story. But uh, as a matter of fact, this is really symbolic of what was going on at the time. The church was just starting to lose its control. And this was one of the first real signs that the church was losing its grip on the people. Um, and this, of course, led to a fracturing of religion into, a, uh, uh, into countless sub-religions. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I clipped this out probably 40 years ago out of the New Yorker and, uh, and, and had it stuck away in my, some drawer and found it the other day and, uh, and thought it fit. You picked the wrong religion, period. I'm not going to argue about it. And, uh, and that's sort of where we are now. Um, as somebody said, they can't all be right but they can all be wrong. Um, and that brings us back to John Templeton, who now, if you recall, this was for, uh, for progress in religion, this prize that he gave. He had some sort of an epiphany in the year 2000, uh, just at the millennium. This was just after he had had uh, uh, they had given the prize to, um, to Ian Barber. Remember, we saw this slide earlier. Mother Teresa got the first one. And then in 1999, it was Ian Barber. And so as the millennium came, apparently Templeton had some sort of an epiphany. And so now look, you know, here we are. I mean, that's kind of awesome. Now, I, I, I have no idea what his epiphany was, but, uh, uh, but it seems to have been pretty strong. And, uh, uh, and his son is now overseeing the, uh, the whole project. And, um, and apparently it's not really changing very much. The last one was, uh, uh, was also a physicist. 